So tonight it's a great pleasure to join with all of you and here in Arab with the Connect Women Network um, because I know that you're supporting and promoting um, opportunities for women in what is actually a very traditionally male profession. Women speaking out as to how it was for them, sharing their personal views, the keys to their success, juggling their various commitments and expectations. And we might ask Fiona in, in a bit what, what, in her view, makes a successful career. What are, what are the elements there? Because I'm going to ask Fiona in a moment to tell us about her life and how she believes we can all contribute to helping girls and women make the choices that are going to make them that force for change that they certainly must be. Fiona's a partner at CMS Cameron McKenna, and she has been since 1981. There weren't very many women partners in, in those days, Fiona. They're still, I think, in relatively short supply um, in, in law firms. And she's been advising more than 25 governments and multilateral agencies, um, including the World Bank. And she advises them on investment in infrastructure and energy reform. Certainly they need uh, a, a bit of advice uh, in, in that direction. I think you qualified as a solicitor in 73. I went to work for Clifford Chance, another of the, the big firms in corporate and banking. I'm not going to spell it all out because you've got such a fantastic CV. Um, but, you know, major energy and uh, um, projects practice that spans law, engineering and economics um, at Cameron McKenna, that's what you have um, delivered and and visiting, visited most countries in the globe, I think. I think you said most of the Arab uh, offices around the world have... Um, not quite. Not quite, <laughs> but, but nearly had Fianna across, across the doorstep, which is fantastic. Um, and lots of local involvement in the City of London. Um, lots of it, obviously, to do with her expertise and legal expertise, engineering, knowledge, knowledge about energy, the, the things that she won her CBE um, to, to recognise but still finds time to be a governor of the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, which I think is lovely. And I think sometimes when we look at high-performing, high-achieving, successful women, we think, golly, do, do, is that all they do? And actually, it's not all you do. I know you do lots of things, but that's one of the, one of the things there, which is completely different, I think, from your, your day job. <laughs> and your academic uh, qualifications, I think, uh, Keele University, that was one of the trendy ones in, uh, in, those, in those early days, and, and then comparative law in Strasbourg, uh, and then a senior fellowship at Harvard. I mean, you've kind of been everywhere, girl, I think, <laughs> um, which, is, which is great. And of course, honorary degrees from here and there, and honorary bench of Middle Temple, which is, which, is, which is tremendous. But tonight, our paths meet again, and we're not rushing up Oxford Street on our, on our different journeys tonight, and it's a real privilege to um, be able to introduce you and, and uh, thank you very much for agreeing to be here. We want you to tell us about the choices you've made. Tell us about some of the people that have helped you. Tell us about the challenges you've had to overcome and how you did it. And importantly, the positive impact that education's had on those choices and opportunities. And I'm sure some people here will want to tweet and if they do, it's hashtag plan talks. Tweet away. <laughs> but importantly, Fiona, tell us. Thank you very much indeed. It's a terrific evening for me to be here in Arab, which I have encountered all over the world and could spend the next 20 minutes telling you about those encounters and the inspirational people that I've met in your organisation. But for this to be twinned with Plan UK, which does so much around the world in such difficult environments, addressing issues that we can't believe are still happening in the 21st century. For these two great organizations to ask me to talk to you, well, it doesn't get any better than that in terms of, of, a, of a great honor. So thank you uh, for, for inviting me. Um, and if I can uh, rise to those uh, four challenges you, you set me, I have to start with education um, and maybe we'll finish there as well because it's what Plan UK is all about and it's, I'm sure, why we're all in the room as well. Um, but my, my career was really, I suppose, presented on a platform of empowerment through education 
and a very special feeling that actually I could learn anything. And that came from maybe my Scottish background. I did five hires rather than the three um, A-levels. So you did a bit of everything. Uh, at Keele at that time, you, you did a foundation year which consisted of what the Americans used to call liberal arts. You did a bit of everything. Uh, on top of that, you had to do um, a different subject each term, and you had to do two different sub subjects throughout the year, and it had to be spread across humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. And then you did joint honours. I did law and psychology, um, and I did computer science and German as subsidiary subjects. And then I did uh, the diploma in comparative law at Strasbourg um, in my third year. And I was learning a lot of stuff. Um, and my goodness me, was it useful? Um, not because I took the little bit of uh, French administrative law that I learnt in Strasbourg and then have used it the rest of my life in every Francophone and civil law country that I've worked in. No, it was, it was more because I had discovered the mindset that you need to adopt in order to learn and then could transfer the knowledge um, and later on the skills that you develop from one situation to another. Because as you'll all know, um, and uh, you know, a lot of you are um, a quarter of my age, um, you are learning new things all the time and it is your ability to learn that actually uh, makes you um, uh, an attractive person to employ, but more importantly, makes you actually cope with the challenges uh, that, uh, that are thrown at you and enables you to deliver the choices. So, yeah, I'm a fan of, um, uh, a fan of education, uh, but the, the, the confidence building that it gave me in my, in my early career um, essentially accounts for the fact that I wound up doing a lot of different things. Uh, whenever somebody asked me to do something, I simply um, got on with it. Largely because actually you didn't really have much choice in those, in those days. <laughs> uh, and you were kind of expected to stay in the same, the, the same job at the same time. And one of the, um, uh, I moved from, uh, when I moved to McKenna's in uh, 1978, um, they threw me into a, 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 a diet of um, mergers and acquisitions and then they came in one day and said, would you like to go to the Bahrain office for three weeks? Um, that actually turned out to be three years <laughs> um, and I wound up um, actually writing the very first Islamic banking in, um, instruments uh, they were Madarab as a kind of insurance uh, policy in that, that, that time. Uh, really quite Mickey Mouse by comparison to what we do now. Uh, in amongst a, a very strong project finance uh, and syndicated lending uh, practice. Um, I had an absolute ball. It was great being a girl. Um, I was greatly in demand for balancing dinner parties, <laughs> especially in the summer months when uh, the, uh, the women were you know, back with their families in the, in the UK. Um, and when I came back from Bahrain, of course I had no practice at all. My partners had taken all the business away from me. Um, and so I had to start again. And uh, guess what? They were looking for some lawyers for the Channel Tunnel. Um, and I was interviewed by Taylor Woodrow and Wimpy, and they said, have you seen a concession agreement for a cross-border tunnel before? <laughs> and I thought, and I said, mm, honesty is the best policy, that's option one. <laughs> um, so I said, no, I haven't. And they said, good, that's the right answer, there hasn't been one. <laughs> And they said that was influential in giving me the job. So, uh, so I worked on the concession agreement, the treaty uh, for the uh, for Eurotunnel. And at the end of that, I was kind of branded as a major projects person. And the next happy accident was that the power station situation in Northern Ireland was not sustainable. 
Um, it was expensive, and uh, Northern Ireland Electricity wanted to build uh, another two units on Kill Route. Um, and Bechtel actually wanted Margaret Thatcher to bless a project to build a lignite-fired plant up in Crumlin. Well, you wouldn't do that now. It was the days before climate change was an issue. Um, and they, Northern Ireland Electricity hired me to prove to the Thatcher government that if they had an independent power plant on the system, the lights would go out. They couldn't be trusted to follow the dispatch instructions from the control room to make sure that demand and supply absolutely matched in real time because you can't store the stuff. Well, you'd be glad to know I failed in that endeavour and we did actually think up a way of writing a power purchase agreement that would incentivise uh, the, uh, uh, the, the power station um, to uh, respond in exactly the way that was needed. And it was by answer, asking a very dumb question uh, that we managed to succeed in getting the project to go away. And the dumb question was, so what would it cost? Um, and the head of tariffs in NIE said, well, we don't know that, as if, you know, that made me feel very small. Um, well, we don't know that because we don't know the mine slope. Um, Lignite-fired plants uh, sit on the top of the mine. Um, uh, it's internally combustible, so you can't transport it very far. So I said, well, why don't you know what the mine slope is? And they said, well, we don't no, because nobody's actually measured it. Um, anyway, cut a very long story short. Uh, it was going to be very expensive indeed, and the project went away, and I became a heroine uh, for seeing off the Thatcher government. At that time, um, there was another fight going on in the electricity industry. The Central Electricity Generating Board did not want its transmission system to be taken away from it as part of a restructuring and privatization. Um, and the unknown to me, because I wasn't involved, um, everybody started becoming very curious about how to handle uh, the government to uh, back, uh, back down on something that they said they were going to do. And I met the head of legal at the CEGB at a conference in Sydney, um, of all places. Um, he had a passion for the Chardonnay grape, uh, and after the dinner in the evening, we would roam the wine bars of Sydney and talk about this. Um, and they published the white paper for the restructuring and privatization while we were there. Um, and to cut a very long story short, because I was the only lawyer who'd been trained in power system operation um, at that time, I got the job of looking after the national grid and becoming its midwife. Um, 700 agreements and codes later, um, I meet Nicholas, who is sitting at the back of the room, um, and he um, is a, a widower with uh, two teenage children, and we uh, delay, we'd actually met on an oil deal, I mean, he wasn't a complete stranger, actually. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but I, tell, I tell you this because I have to answer one of Janet's questions in a moment. Um, we delayed our wedding until after the National Grid had vested in its new company. Was that a condition? <laughs> it was. It was, absolutely. It was kind of... Um, it, it, it wound up being a sort of board meeting with 400 guests. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, everybody said, so what are you going to do now? Are you, presumably you're going to retire and look after the children. Um, and actually, those of you, have got any step-parents in the room? You'll know it doesn't work like that. Um, uh, and in any event, uh, you, will, you, will, you will never take the role of, of their mother. Um, but he um, had an idea that this was technology that uh, I had developed with my team, team of about 40 lawyers, um, and that it would be actually very interesting to explore what was going on 
with the, in the rest of the world and see if this was technology that we could export because lots of countries were looking at the same sort of issues that we were looking at here, which was that there was increasing demand, uh, the need for building more power stations and more transmission, and above all, more distribution uh, to connect uh, more people who were actually lacking electricity, the unmet need, which was holding social and economic development back. So he encouraged me to, uh, to export um, what, what we had learned and, of course, we're in that to learn a whole load more. Anyway, I mustn't go on for, uh, for too long, but then finally, uh, the, as when I was president of the Law Society, somebody pulled my sleeve and said, would you like to become an alderman when you finish being president? There's a vacancy coming up. The greatest challenge and the most scary thing I've ever done is to fight a local election for a very small ward of 242 electors, because half of it was a building site, and doubtless Arab were working on it, <laughs> um, right in the heart by sort of monument, um, that, that, that corner uh, there. Um, and with the elect electors who were not residents um, and really actually wanted to just get on with their job, and keep their noses in their computer screens. Again, I have Nicholas to thank, who distributed my election leaflets and got through all sorts of gatekeepers and said, you would like to have a woman elected, wouldn't you, to all the girls on reception? <laughs> um, which, was, uh, which was brilliant. Um, and, and, and from there, I had what by modern standards is a, is a pretty meteoric um, rise to, to becoming sheriff. Uh, which is about standing in for the Lord Mayor um, because he'll travel for about 100 days of the year. Um, and when I was sheriff, Michael Bear was the Lord Mayor who was on the board of Arup. Everywhere we went, um, somebody from Arup would meet us and take us to some incredibly imaginatively shaped building. There was one in the UAE shaped like a coin called the Dirham. Uh, Shanghai, I mean, was just uh, um, uh, amazing. Wang Chou, I think Arab had actually designed the whole city. Um, and you're thinking, these guys can do anything. And I was actually so glad when, when our niece um, did, did, a, did a year's work experience here before going to Cambridge to do engineering. Um, it was uh, terrific. And so one of my plans now for, um, uh, for my, my, my own mayoralty, I'm not really um, allowed to uh, present myself, um, yet we can only have one Lord Mayor at a, at a time, but, uh, but obviously being the second woman to be the Lord Mayor, uh, you would expect me to be asking the question, is the city's talent pool diverse and inclusive enough? Um, does it have and um, provide access uh, to it, the, the talent from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, from, from the disabled, um, from all sorts of uh, walks of life and backgrounds? Um, or is it actually really, in reality, a bit overly pale and male, as they say in South Africa? Um, now, actually, I, I interact with a, with a, with a, a, a lot of uh, women in banking and finance who are in their mid-career uh, levels um, uh, and becoming more and more senior. Um, and I do actually worry about what I call the 7.8% uh, the problem, which is if you look at women in senior executive positions, I'm um, not talking about women on boards, but just you know, senior executive positions, only 7.8% um, are women. Um, but we will be um, uh, doing a program called Tomorrow's City that will, will feature diversity and inclusion. But you'll be glad to know that it will also uh, include uh, what I think you know as the Smart City Agenda, um, which is... Uh, making the point that 
is it right to expect governments to be solely responsible for sustainable development? Um, if you have a public-private partnership as a financing model, is it right that the public part should be at a government level? After all, governments don't have much money these days, as we know, um, and they've not been able to take concerted collective action on climate change either. So shouldn't we actually be looking for cities to show leadership in sustainable urban development? After all, by 2050, 70% of 9 billion will be living in cities. And if we optimize the infrastructure a bit more smartly, um, and we've been talking about um, district heating um, and optimizing uh, load, uh, loads, um, as well as optimizing the, the, the generation, op optimizing the way that it's used, capturing the kinetic energy from um, the underground system, storing it, all these sorts of things. Uh, better models of, of, of financing for long-term value creation for people and for the planet, for job creation, and for creating the funds that we need to help people out of poverty, which takes us back to where we started with girls in education. So you've really shared the journey um, of, of your professional career with, with us all this evening, and what a journey. Um, it's, been, it's been tremendous to, to listen to you, and I know that for many people in this room, there will be all sorts of resonances at all a number of different, a number of different levels. And so thank you very, very much indeed.